begin with, we should probably take a moment to discuss the main brains behind this radical idea. The gentleman's name was Henry Flagler, born in 1830. He was an American industrialist and one of the founders of the Standard Oil Company. If that name rings a bell, it's because that was the company that was also owned by one John D. Rockefeller, one of the richest men in history. And the Standard Oil Company was the reason why America had to put in some anti-monopoly laws because they basically bought out all the competition and were effectively the only oil company around anymore. Now, Flagler's often overshadowed by Rockefeller because, well, it's Rockefeller. Now, I could easily make a whole video dedicated to the shenanigans involving Flagler, Rockefeller, and the Standard Oil Company, but for our purposes, we're gonna kinda glance over it and just simply point out that because of the Standard Oil Company and what ended up happening with it, Flagler, much like Rockefeller, was blindingly rich. The man had so much money. Just an insane amount of money. If Rockefeller was the Bezos of his day, then Flagler was the Musk. In the 1870s, Flagler would move to Florida with his wife, and she had taken ill and he felt that the warmer weather in Florida might be better for her health than the cold winters of the north. It was down here that he started developing his other interests beyond Standard Oil. Though he would remain on the board of directors, he gave up his day-to-day -day involvement in that company to pursue the construction of resort hotels as well as railroads. Railroad Tycoon is a great video game, but it's also a direct reference to well, railroad tycoons, an actual historical thing. In those days, railroad companies were insanely profitable, and anyone who was able to make a successful one was loaded. Flagler knew this quite well, and he had plenty of capital from Standard Oil to purchase existing short-line railroads and develop them into what would become the Florida East Coast Railway. It's also probably worth mentioning that Flagler had a habit of utilizing what was called convict leasing in order to secure labor for his projects in Florida. It was a system of forced penal labor that was historically practiced in the southern United States, and it tended to overwhelmingly involve African American men, and it might have something to do with the whole not actually being allowed to have slaves anymore, so they decided to force the convicts to work instead. Yeah, that doesn't really put Flagler in the best light, I know. But, uh, it, it is a historical fact, I can't ignore it. I'm not gonna pretend like it didn't happen, because that's an absolute thing that happened. The Florida East Coast Railway was built on the backs of forced convict labor. And though it's definitely a dark spot in that railroad's history, it's worth mentioning the Florida East Coast Railway is actually still around, believe it or not. It's still operating in Florida, although it's currently owned by Grupo Mexico. In 1905, Flagler became super interested in the idea of an overseas railroad. He wanted to extend Florida East Coast lines to Key West, which is an island in the Straits of Florida. It is not only a major tourist location, but it also happened to have the closest deep water port to the Panama Canal. Flagler, for better or for worse, definitely had a scent for monetary gain, and he thought the idea of an overseas railroad was also a novel concept, but this was not an easy undertaking. It would be a hard thing to do even now. I mean, we're talking about building, well, a bridge. A long bridge. A consistent long bridge repeatedly, over the ocean. There's a reason why you generally don't do that. I mean, no one would want to build a bridge over, say, the Atlantic Ocean. And though we're not talking about that kind of distance here, it was still a monumental undertaking and kind of crazy. It was initially called Flagler's Folly, as people thought it just couldn't be done. Flagler sent his engineer, William J. Crome, to survey the land to try to see what the best route could be for this new extension. Eventually, they settled on the idea that if they ran the railroad south to Key Largo and then followed the islands of the Florida Keys all the way out to Key West, it would make their job just a little bit easier, because at least then the bridges would be anchored between the islands and not just out in the middle of the ocean. With the route planned out, construction began that same year and it would take them seven years to complete this project, and at one time over 4,000 men were employed to do the work. During that time, they were hit with three different hurricanes, one in 1906, one in 1909, and one in 1910, all of which threatened to halt the project, but they didn't give up. Despite everything, they managed to complete this work in 1912. Henry Flagler himself rode the first train to Key West aboard his private rail car and he was immensely proud of achieving something that people said simply couldn't be done. He was quite old by this point, and he would pass away the following year. In total, the project cost an insane $50 million in early 1900s money. Calculating that for today, that means this project cost 1 
billion six hundred million dollars. A ludicrous amount of money for a railroad, regardless of how impressive it was. Although people were definitely impressed, it was widely called the eighth wonder of the world at the time, and during the next couple decades it operated regularly, taking passengers between the islands and the mainland. Although the freight traffic volume that Flagler expected actually wound up being disappointing. The vast majority of the freight trains that did operate on the lines were actually tank cars just transporting fresh water to Key West as the island didn't have immediate access to potable water. But with the project completed, the Florida East Coast Railway saw quite a bit of success. But I bet you're wondering, well how did the railway wind up underwater? I mean, you can kind of see how that could happen since it's an overseas railway and if it fell over, like, at all, it's going in the ocean. The problem started in the 1930s when the Great Depression hit. The Depression hit a lot of industries hard, and the railroads were no exception to this. A lot of them were able to hang on only because the people that could find jobs still had to commute to those jobs. They still made money off of that sort of thing. The problem for the Florida East Coast Railway was that it was mostly a tourist and leisure railway, and that sort of activity really died down during the Depression. They were already bankrupt by the time their precious overseas railroad was... lost. The year was 1935, and it was Labor Day. A hurricane had made landfall. Known as the Great Labor Day Hurricane of 1935, it is considered one of the most intense hurricanes ever to strike the United States. In fact, in terms of pressure, it is THE most intense hurricane, with winds reaching a horrifying 185 miles per hour, or 295 kilometers per hour. Towns were wiped off the map, and hundreds of people were killed or injured. The Overseas Railway had stood up to hurricanes in the past, but the Labor Day storm was something else entirely. It ripped the tracks, the bridges, and even some of the trains themselves apart, rendering the surviving structures unusable and sinking the rest of it beneath the waves. Since the Florida East Coast Railway was bankrupt at the time, they had no way to rebuild the destroyed sections. It would just have been too expensive. It was impossible. So instead, in order to bail themselves out of their financial hardships, they actually sold the roadbed and the remaining bridges to the state of Florida. The state would then turn around and instead of rebuilding a railway, they used some of the surviving infrastructure to build the overseas highway to Key West, which still stands today. Although most of the original bridges were replaced in the 1980s, you can still find some of the leftovers in certain places if you know where to look. Additionally, some remnants remain beneath the waves. And despite its destruction, it is a testament to human ingenuity. It was something that people did not believe was possible to build. And it was done. It's something to reflect on. A time when railroads were the kings of transportation, and a time when crazy industrialists built bridges over the ocean just because they could. Till next time, this is Darkness, and I bid you all a fond farewell.